Good afternoon, and welcome to Journalism Works from the Knight Studio at the Museum in Washington, D.C. I'm Gene Polisinski, the Chief Operating Officer of the Museum Institute and host of today's program. We want to welcome those of you in the studio, but also those of you watching this program on the live stream online or later when it's posted at museum.org and on other websites as well that we'll talk about during the program. More journalists are behind bars overseas than ever before, um, in more countries than at any other time in history. A group of University of Maryland journalism students are exploring and, and actively pursuing and carrying out new ways to reach out to these journalists, to call attention to their plight, to reach out to us uh, who are watching and here today to support them and to tell their stories. We'll hear today what they've learned about the state of journalism abroad and be introduced to their new campaign, Press Uncuffed, uh, which is uh, done, being done in partnership with the Committee to Protect Journalists and with a goal, I think, of aiming to produce the freedom for these journalists. Uh, we have a number of panelists with us today uh, to talk about this student-driven program. And uh, let me, in no particular order, uh, introduce them. Uh, Leila Sarsavik, uh, who investigated the case of Peter Grist, yeah. uh, a freelance journalist for Al Jazeera, who was held in an Egyptian prison for 400 days before his recent release, uh, last month, I believe. Um, Teddy Aminabar, who found an entire network of Ethiopian bloggers in exile as he was investigating the imprisonment of Eskinder Nega, mm -hmm. who has been in prison in Ethiopia since 2011. Courtney Maybeus uh, is successfully using so social media tools to find out the truth about journalists imprisoned in Azerbaijan, which recently, unfortunately, has launched a major crackdown on journalists. Courtney Raj, who is the Advocacy and Outreach Director of the Committee to Protect Journalists, and has been working with these students in a campaign to raise awareness about this historic number of journalists who are behind bars. And Dana Priest, who is a longtime Washington Post reporter and the newly appointed Knight Chair in Public Affairs Journalism at the Philip Merrill College of Journalism at the University of Maryland. Um, this class works at a number of levels, I understand, from talking with you briefly. It's um, teaching students how to report on sensitive subjects, um, particularly about foreign policy, how to do that work while still here in the U.S. And also, it, I think it's a, the better angels part of journalism in a way to, to go out and, and, if not change the world, change the lives of some of these people who are are behind bars. Can you talk for a minute, Dana, about this project and mm -hmm. how it got started and, and what you hope to achieve? Well, it was my first class um, making that transition between full-time reporter at the Post and coming to teach. And I wanted to find a way that might grab the students and I thought that doing, giving them each a particular individual behind bars rather than the big topic would both help to deepen their reporting, which is a good skill that they and all journalists need, but also um, might show them what people around the world put, um, put at risk in order to do what we in the United States take for granted. And especially, I think, maybe a younger generation who is growing up with social media and with having to learn all the platform technologies, uh, really to focus on what is the essence of what we do, which is accountability journalism and to hold the governments uh, and others um, accountable for what they do. You know, last June, in this very room, uh, Kathleen Carroll, who is executive editor yes. of AP, was, uh, t had, had spoken at the rededication of our journalist memorial, and, and I think she brought that point out very dramatically, that uh, we take so much for granted here. That conversation on the cell phone in the morning in which we're critical of a government official or a program mm -hmm. just goes away after we're done. But in a lot of countries, you have to worry whether there's a knock on the door in the next hour or so. Um, when you set out to do this, what were some of the concerns you might have had uh, in structuring this class? And uh, there's a certain uh, danger in the world today by identifying yourself as standing up for people who say things people don't want to hear. Right. I mean, the danger is really to the people that the students were reaching out to, not anywhere, not a danger here. And so we did bring in um, someone who could help with, uh, with um, you know, making the networks that they spoke over encrypted or using certain social media that is less likely to be eavesdropped on or using, you know, as I would call cutouts, you know, people who can get to the people who really are at risk and can't be talking directly. And, and this came up in almost every country 
Uh, and then on the other side of that, what also came up that was surprising to me, and Courtney's probably going to talk a lot about this uh, in a minute, is is how you can use social media to to get inside of very closed countries without even leaving the United States. And so really the world is global, that's such a trite way to put it, but for reporters that's uh, very important to know how to do that sort of um, do that sort of work without without leaving. And then the other component is how do you, um, for me it was how how do I orient students vis-a-vis uh, -vis Washington? You know we think of Washington as this big you know, obviously the center of the universe, we all think. But it's actually a small town, if you look at it that way. And everybody knows each other who's operating in the government. And it, so my task was to try to explain that to students in a way that they could then see it that way and, and, and get interviews with people who could get them information in the center of the circle, inside of government. Well, we're going to ask the students at some point to talk about your journalist and about the work that you've done. But a good chance to ask Courtney Raj about Committee to Protect Journalists and uh, its engagement in this project, which is being driven by the students. Um, how, how did it, that come about from your organization? You, on a daily basis at your organization, mm -hmm. are out, uh, as it says, protecting journalists, the Committee to Protect, but also tracking who's in jail. Um, so this dovetails in many ways with what you do, but why a student component? Well, I think it was really exciting to actually work with Dana over the past, I guess, almost a year, uh, speaking to each of her classes about the issue of imprisoned journalists and just the idea that uh, journalists would care about that and write about it, not just um, you know about the maybe Western journalists um, imprisoned abroad, but also the local journalists who make up the vast majority of journalists who are imprisoned and, and killed for that matter. And so um, every year around World Press Freedom Day, we have launched a Free the Press campaign, which takes different forms. Last year, we highlighted 10 journalists to free, and it was like primarily social media. So when this opportunity came up, I mean, it was so cool to hear how inspired the students were by working on these stories and how when you get to know these people who are behind bars. I mean, I've had the privilege of meeting Khadija Ismailova and you know being on a panel with her and being in Azerbaijan with her. And then when you find out that she's been unjustly imprisoned for her reporting, you know, it, it means something. And so it was so cool to see um, the students get inspired by that. And then they you know came up with this amazing project and then they said they wanted to donate money to CPJ so that we could help more journalists. It just seemed like such a natural partnership and a way to you know, give our campaign some, some new energy to really just find these synergies. And together, we can do far more than we can alone. Well, we're going to come back to the mechanics and the outcomes and the, and the work that you've been doing. But I know there's a video about uh, the program which launched yesterday, Pressed Uncuffed. So I think if we can see that video. Yes, and this is uh, an outgrowth of the class. A lot of students said, what more can we do? And we came up with the idea of an Indiegogo campaign, which frankly I'd never heard of that word before. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm just rolling off my tongue. And, uh, and as part of that, they put together a video uh, that we're about to see, and you can find that on Indiegogo.com. Good. So we'll roll that video. My journalist's name is Wabshet Tay. Wynn Van Hai. My journalist's name is Skinder Nega. My journalist's name. My journalist's name. My journalist's name. My journalist's name is Riyad Alamo. Mashallah Shamsul Vaisin. Hatice Duman. Rahman Shahi. Ida My journalist was charged with terrorism acts. For speaking out against the Communist Party of Vietnam. For illegally entering Afghanistan. In charges of separatism with spreading propaganda against the state. He's been jailed in Egypt for falsifying news and endangering national security. For spreading anti-government propaganda. For defamation. For propaganda against the state. Terrorism and treason. He received death threats for uncovering government corruption. Your donation will allow us to make bracelets, each with the name of a journalist languishing in prison. The money we raise from selling them will be donated to the Committee to Protect Journalists. Help us tell their stories and work for their freedom. Please donate today.
That's quite something. Uh, let's talk for just a second and go through uh, our student members of the group here. Uh, how has it changed the way you think about journalism, if it has? A lot. Um, I think the most effective part about this campaign and why I want to get more involved is just that we know uh, when you're at the Philip Merrill College of Journalism, it's very nice. It's brand new. Uh, I love being there. You have, uh, you know, these nice computers, and and then you have these like. I've talked to many journalists when I focused, you know, I focused specifically on Iskander Nega, um, and press freedom in Ethiopia, and I had these really long conversations with this one specific blogger who's now in America, and you just kind of realize that it's just not the same. And I, I mean, I know, you know, like. I know that you would know that beforehand, but when you really get their personal stories, you kind of realize that you, you understand that more. And so being at the college and having all these opportunities, you, you appreciate what you have and want to try to make more of it. Uh, I think my answer would be very similar to Teddy's. Uh, I've, having worked as a journalist for a number of years before coming back with my master's, I didn't really so much think about the access to information and how vital that is for communities so much. So I think you're really kind of thinking about it on a very meta, to use a buzzword, uh, a meta level. Um, and in my reporting, so I've got a uh, Azerbaijani journalist named Seymour Hazi. Um, just, you know, he's in prison, uh, and, and in my process of reporting on him, I've reached out to a number of um, other colleagues of his through Facebook, social media, I used a lot of Twitter to reach out to these folks. A lot of them are now living in other countries in exile, having dealt with a lot of um, uh, similar situations and beatings and so forth, unfortunately, in their own work. Um, and so many of them have been so helpful, so forthcoming, so grateful for the reporting that we're doing. Um, but you just, you really don't think about how good you have it as a reporter in the United States sometimes. Yeah, I think, you know, we get frustrated when you're on the phone to an official and you're getting stonewalled and, you know, that kind of thing. But when you realize that it's so much more intense somewhere else and that just getting a document isn't just making a phone call, it's something else um, that's far more dangerous, that's far more complex. Um, and I think also kind of echoing what Teddy was saying is that realizing that these people are just doing their work in their own part of the world and trying to make their little part of the world better and bring out some light and bring out some truth. And to kind of, to expand that worldview is just, I think, was a really rewarding thing for me, personally. Dana, what have you gotten out of this project so far? <coughs> I, oh, amazing things. First of all, I am so impressed with what the students were able to find out, really. Um, and I love the fact that a couple times during the class, uh, at night, I would get these texts from a student, one of them's here, Mike, who had a, um, <laughs> Vietnamese um, man who was in prison and he got, he was freed in the middle of the class and he texts me saying, oh my gosh, she's out, you know, I'm about to cry. And it was just, that that kind of connection was really, to me, very special because I don't think you're gonna forget that. And, you know, the other thing is that I've been a journalist for 30 years and I had no idea the situation was so bad. No idea. So that, to me, really opened my eyes. Did the CPJ hear that? that we don't have in this country or in many of the countries where there's a, at least a modicum of press freedom, we don't know how bad it really is. Yes, I think, that, I think that's true. Um, I think there's a lack of awareness about how difficult and challenging it is to be a journalist abroad and the truly horrific um, you know, dangers that they're putting themselves in to report the truth, to hold their governments accountable, um, to reveal corrupt business practices, to report on the environment, um, to write an editorial cartoon about an issue of public interest. I mean, I think there's a lot of maybe disenchantment with the press in the US sometimes, but if you truly think about it, I mean, when you open your email in the morning or you open your newspaper, you want to see the stories there. So think about look at the bylines next time and think about what that person went through to bring that story. Um, I think there's not a real awareness because it's just hard to fathom that the government uh, could imprison journalists. But that's, I think, one of the benefits of this sort of campaign and this focus is 
There is a clear actor that is responsible that we should advocate to. So states have the sole responsibility for imprisoning journalists, and therefore they have the ability to release them. And so there really is no excuse. And so, you know, in some ways there's a clear advocacy focal point. It's not always clear who has the power to influence Ethiopia or Vietnam or Iran, you know, when there aren't direct uh, advocacy channels. So sometimes it's really figuring out, okay, you know, there's a transatlantic partnership uh, deal being negotiated that has trade implications for Vietnam? Is there some way to get press freedom on the agenda to raise this as an issue? So it's always like really looking at each and every case and in each and every country and thinking about what are the patterns of influence? What can we do to get these people out? And it's amazing. We have an International Press Freedom Award every year. We recognize journalists. And it is so amazing to meet the journalists who have been led out of prison. It is one of the most meaningful moments of my life. You know, when you hear that, I think it's time for us to meet at least three of those journalists who you've been researching in the class and the three of you have followed. So uh, we didn't pick a particular order, uh, but uh, one, one of you start and the other two come in and talk to us about the journalist that you're following, that you're learning about, that you're working to get free. Yeah, um, I mentioned his name before, uh, Skinner Nega. He has been working as a journalist in Ethiopia since the 1990s. Um, when I wrote my article, I actually really focused more on the effect that he had um, in, in what is becoming an involving, uh, evolving digital landscape in Ethiopia. So um, the access to the internet, internet in Ethiopia is really poor um, relative to neighboring countries, but you know, like every nation, they're dealing with the approaches to citizen journalism and what it means now that you can be a reporter with just holding your cell phone or your laptop. And so what Iskinder Nega did is really set up a premise of journalism that isn't just from the state, that's providing a voice that these you know, bloggers, not just citizen journalists, bloggers and other journalists really advocated on on digital scale. And so that's kind of where I got into. And I think that's a really interesting discussion. Um, internet in Ethiopia is state-owned. So it's definitely more restricted. And it's just, it's a completely different world in terms of when you pick up your phone to talk or you, you know, press enter to publish that blog and like the implications that could or could not happen. Um, I remember one, one official once just said that, you know, they, the effect from one journalist being imprisoned or, or bullied in some way, it's just, it's just such a chilling effect and it silenced so many others who were on the fence or just you know, working in small ways to, to do some type of journalism on the ground. So, Courtney. Uh, so my journalist is named uh, Seymour Hazi. Uh, he's from Azerbaijan, which um, if, uh, it's interesting. When I started kind of working with Dana on, on some projects, I couldn't even say Azerbaijan. <laughs> um, now it's, it's become a country that I've unfortunately learned uh, so much about that's very negative. Um, the country's got a, a very bad habit right now of uh, imprisoning a lot of uh, human rights defenders. There's about 100 in jail, um, including a number of journalists. So and he, uh, Seymour is one. Uh, another very high profile one, uh, Khadija Ismailova, uh, whose name uh, some of you may have heard. I know that Courtney mentioned it. Um, but so uh, Seymour has been working for, was working for a number of years uh, for a opposition newspaper ca called uh, As a Leak. Uh, he's also a presenter on a broadcast uh, program um, called uh, Azerbaijan Sati, which translates to Azerbaijan Hour. Uh, he's uh, just really been somebody who's written a lot about corruption, been very, um, uh, he's an opposition journalist, so he's been very critical of the current uh, political climate, in, in particular uh, uh, President Ilham uh, Aliyev. Uh, so in Seymour's case, uh, he'd been kind of, he, from, from my reporting, I've been able to kind of tell that he sort of knew to expect something, but what he wasn't sure or when. Uh, he was at a bus stop last August and was approached by a man. They got into a scuffle and within a matter of seconds the police were there to arrest him. He's been in jail since and on January 29th was sentenced to five years. So um, that's kind of his story. And the charges are not 
his journalism. Right, right. It, it has yeah. nothing to do yeah. do with his journalism. His charges are ag aggregated, uh, aggravated hooliganism. Um, <laughs> and what happened in, in his case with, when the when the guy approached him at the bus stop, the the story that I've been told through through my reporting is that. Um, he was, uh, this man approached Seymour and accused him of, you know, why haven't you responded to my Facebook message? And, and what came <laughs> so out was, in, in yeah. trial was that this particular person who attacked him actually did not even have a Facebook account at the time. So, um, so clearly just to set up, yeah, right, to, uh, right. provoke and evoke the response. Exactly. That they okay. exactly. We're going to come back to that subject, by the way, of journalistic uh, charges or related charges mm -hmm. and, and some other kinds of ways of getting to journalists. Let's go to your story first. Yeah, um, for me, by the time the class started, I'd been following my journalist story for quite some time. Um, I had Peter Grest uh, as an Australian. I was interested in his story. Um, and so it was really excited to get that. But what was kind of a challenge was getting at some new aspect of the story. His trial, his story was so well covered in The Guardian, in, in the Australian three, media, uh, everywhere. Al journalists. Yeah. Through Al Jazeera, yeah. that I just kind of, that was my really big challenge. And so one day I just tweeted out to everybody that I'd made a list of, that I thought, okay, maybe you'd want to talk to me, maybe you'd want to talk to me. And the only person that got back to me was his brother. Um, and I started talking to him, and we had some Skype interviews, and I got a really great opportunity to also speak to his uncle. And the uncle was not somebody that was really involved in any media hmm. interviews and things like that with anybody else. It was primarily the two brothers and the parents. And so it was really great to speak to the uncle who just really liked telling a good story. So it was great. I spent three hours with him and just let him talk. And he told me all kinds of really amazing things. And um, for me, the story became about the family coping with this situation and being put in the situation almost a little bit less about Peter and more about them and how are they organized and how are they getting through this and that was really fascinating. Well I think me. that's an important point that, that there's obviously the jail journalist who is the focal point of the repression and, the, and, the, and being in prison but there's an entire family network, there's a professional network that's impacted by this you mentioned mm -hmm. briefly the intimidation factor mm -hmm. but uh, before we go away from the subject. Um, I think Joel Simon, who is uh, executive director of uh, CPJ, has a new book, and then he talks about repressive governmental leaders, and he talks about dictators, and I think he uses the phrase democratators, which I've been fascinated <laughs> by, uh, which is someone who uses a seemingly uh, democratic or semi-democratic process to, to legitimatize their efforts and to many times to pass laws that aren't the edicts of a dictator, they're supposedly the will of a legislature or, uh, and they are very repressive uh, and very often then journalists are targeted under those. What is in the class at large, is there a, a thread where um, the old things about stirring up, maybe not necessarily opposition, but just uh, attacking the government or being supplanted by you didn't pay your taxes, you, you're guilty of a sex crime, you are, or accused of a sex crime, you're guilty of assault and battery. Is that the new democratator uh, approach to uh, trying to suppress journalism and move it out of a very clear sphere where it's clearly just a repressive act against a voice? Is that what's happening? Are we finding that in this I, class? You know, I think we're finding two, the two extremes. One is making up charges like in Courtney's case, but the other one is charging journalists for being terrorists mm -hmm. under new terrorism laws that were uh, passed in many countries, including, uh, unfortunately, a number of our allies, like Turkey, um, that then were used against journalists who are in the opposition, which is another buzzword. It means if you're not a propaganda arm, then you're in the opposition rather than an independent sure. media. So we see, see that on both uh, extremes. One of the uh, things that we've been hearing, uh, and again, as in our work largely aimed at the Journalist Memorial, which is journalists who have died in the past year, um, is that uh, journalists are no longer uh, sort of have a safe harbor. That at one time or another, they might have been viewed as, well, we need to get our story out. But today, because governments can go directly to people uh, or terrorists or whoever can use the, the Internet, uh, the journalists are now actually a, a liability. Uh, are you finding that this new technology has complicated the lives either for your individual journalists or on a global scale? Are we seeing the technology ironically making it worse for journalists? 
Yeah, I mean, so in Ethiopia, the telecom services are all state-owned, um, so that, of course, plays a huge role. Uh, I think also, though, that, you know, I also see specifically in Ethiopia, because of the whole internet, because of what internet is doing in the role of journalism, it's also harder to control. Um, and, and so I think you see, you see cases, I, I, guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is I wouldn't say it's also limiting. Um, but obviously there are definitely attempts to give the state message rather than go through journalism's yeah. prism. And another way of saying that in a way is that they used to shut down the publication. Now yeah. it seems like they're moving to shut down the individual journalist because they are a publication if they would. Mm -hmm. I think that there's, we're in a time of great disruption in the media field and in journalism and so you have all these pressures that are undermining journalists' previously privileged role in the information cycle. It's coming from above in terms of leaders that can bypass, uh, you know, bypass the media entirely to take their message out directly or increasingly as, as you referred to use things like economic or advertising boycotts or, you know, odd rules like in Russia where you can't, uh, you can't privately advertise or you can't advertise on private channels, which is so odd, um, or, you know, hooliganism charges or whatever to clamp down on the press. And then simultaneously from the bottom up, you've got the expansion of blogging and citizen journalism. And so you've got these pressures from underneath that are also, you know, changing kind of the role of journalists. And so they're facing all of these multiple pressures. You've got the rise of non-state actors. Um, they're you know, so diverse and obviously incredibly dangerous uh, for journalists as are governments. <laughs> uh, but I think, again, when we talk about imprisonment, that's something where the government is responsible for the journalist's safety. Oh, and, and also please. I have to say that one of, one of the things that I learned uh, that I didn't fully appreciate was you know, who, who do you call a journalist these days? And coming from the mainstream journalism, I had a very narrow view of that. Not that you had to get a certificate or be trained, but you had to have, I don't know, you had to have an institution behind you. Um, and that institution demanded certain things from you, plus they edited you and they made sure that you were you know, on the straight and narrow, more, more or less. But really, when you look at what the internet has allowed, not just, um, not just reporters, but photographers, that's one of my greatest examples in, in Bahrain, for instance, where they've imprisoned so many Bahraini photographers who were taking photos uh, during the 2011 end of the Arab Spring that really prompted a lot of um, demonstrations in Bahrain, pro-democracy mostly, and the government had a swift and very harsh crackdown and they would not let any foreign journalists in the country and they kicked out those that were there. Well, the people that were left were the Bahraini journalists and, and photographers who, some of them started out as hobbyists, but then they loved it and they went into freelancing and then they connected with these other non-traditional agencies that um, pass out their photos nationwide. So we end up publishing on the front page of the Post and the Times some of these reporters work and you know have no idea that this is a really big, they, they are filling a huge void now around the world. And can I just add to that on the freelancer subject? Because I think you see that also the increasing use of freelancers. And so there is this effort going on um, the, around the freelancer guidelines that kind of set out some principles for both freelancers and news organizations to adopt to try to increase the safety and the responsibility around freelancers. I wanted to add in the example of Azerbaijan, you've got, so we were talking about technology and whether, you know, getting the message out. Um, uh, I th in, in Azerbaijan, you've got sort of the state-owned media, so you've got the message that's getting out there. But I think in the, the example of my, my particular journalist and his, in, in his um, publication, it was a publication that's very well known, um, 200,000, I think, circulation at one point. It's now about eight, and it's being run out of um, France by the editor. <laughs> um, so, but it does have a, an internet presence, and um, I, I had a conversation with uh, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, a couple weeks ago. Um, one thing that, that they had said was that, well, so their bureau was shut down right after Christmas, uh, so now anything that they're doing, they're doing out of Prague. Um, but they are so reliant on Facebook to 
um, get their get their word out, get their news out, and they've got a huge presence on face on Facebook. Um, when I was in the process of trying to reach uh, who I can, who I could about my journalist, and, my, and I'm still in Dana's class, so my my project is ongoing. Um, I'm still waiting to see where it may take me. Um, but with um, but in, in this case, so many Azeris um, were so happy to talk with me. So many of them are very open. Um, and, and I don't know if that's maybe uh, how Facebook operates in Azerbaijan, if, if their rules are different. But if you, uh, any, any normal Azeri, or at least the ones I've spoken to, have thousands of friends. That's, you know, that's huge. <laughs> that's, uh, you know, and, and a way to keep in touch, a way right. to get around so it, a it's, channel. It seems to be a really big tool for them to communicate with amongst each other. Well, for those of you who have joined us online since we began, this is Journalism Works from the Museum in Washington, D.C. I'm Gene Polisinski, and we're talking to three students from the Philip Merrill College of Journalism at the University of Maryland about a unique project they have to track and to highlight journalists who are in prison. We also have uh, their professor, uh, the newly appointed Knight Chair in Public Affairs Journalism at the Philip Merrill College, Dana Priest, and from the Committee to Protect Journalists, we have Courtney Raj. And, um, I wanted to ask each of the students, uh, since Journalism Works is a program also about what you're doing, but also about how you're doing it. So I'm curious, how did you identify a specific journalist, and, and then how did the, the class identify specific journalists? And then talk for just a moment about the mechanics of doing your work. You know, I think people often don't know much about how a story comes together. Well, these are stories. How did they come together? But first, how did you select a particular journal. Well, I selected them. <laughs> <laughs> and because I did, question I, too. Yeah, no. yeah, really. I didn't want to waste time on, you know, looking for the right journalist. So I really <laughs> I selected them. I gave everybody a picture of the journalist so that they would have, you know, this person in front of them. And then they went to work. So, yeah. Um, well, how, how did you locate them? How did you get the them of that? Because you have a, a story or a face, but there's clearly... A, a lot of personality, a lot of the person engaged in that. And I'm, I mean, I'm just curious, you didn't go there. In some no. cases, you couldn't go there. Um, <laughs> how do you know about the them behind that surface photo? Um, I mean, again, to kind of back up what I was saying earlier, Peter was a very well-known journalist. In that he, case, yeah. Yeah, in that, that case. But you know, um, I don't know much about him as a person. I don't know the well, daily the, details. The, for me, it was the family. So um, it was like, Courtney does, I, I used social media to get mm -hmm. to them. Um, I mean, I, right now I work from home and I, and I work on... But you also got an interview with him. Right. In jail. Right. In so prison. all of my stuff is online. So basically what had happened is after talking to the uncle, um, I said, they, they told me that basically what they do is that they try to have a family member in Egypt almost at all times. So they were on a rotational basis okay. visiting him there. And I talked to the uncle and I said, well, who's, who's over there now? Who's going soon? He said, oh, a Andrew is, and Andrew's the brother. Um, so I emailed Andrew and I said, hey, Andrew, I know you're going over. How long are you going to be there for? Can I, can I give you a letter to pass on to Peter? I, you know, uh, okay. They were taking letters from people, but I was kind of like, eh. Um, and he said, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, I'm going to be there for three days, and then I'm going to go somewhere else, and then I'm going to come back for a day. And I went, oh, OK, well, it's not going to. I didn't have high hopes. Um, so I just typed something up, sent it to him, and then on, on a Sunday morning at like 7.30 in the morning, my phone was DC next to time. my bed, <laughs> DC time, it goes off and I'm just kind of like, yeah. And I looked at it and as soon as, you know, as soon as my email says Grest, I kind of wake up. <laughs> um, and it was Andrew and he had taken pictures of four handwritten pages. Um, that Peter had written. Um, he'd responded to as many of my questions as he could. There was a bunch of questions that he couldn't respond to. Um, and he said, took them for me. He's like, oh, I'm in, you know, in a hotel room, but here you go. Um, and I texted Dana at 7.30 in the morning on a Sunday. Sorry. <laughs> no, that was great. <laughs> um, and I said, wow, I, I have this letter. And, and I, it was a big basis of, of my story. Couldn't answer questions too politically sensitive, too dangerous to answer? Yeah, I really tried to, um, I wanted to get a very kind of a portrait of where he was. Um, and I knew that, you know, I knew some details about the prison. Um, I looked at Google Maps, I looked at where it was geographically, I got details from, from the brother and so on. But I wanted to know what his, what his life was like. 
Um, and he couldn't really answer those things, but he had done some pretty kind of industrious things. Um, he started making his own bread that he did from some flour and some apple, uh, pineapple juice. Um, he had these two liter plastic bottles, these Coke bottles, I guess, that he would fill with water and use them as weights. Um, all these really interesting things that these little details that I would get um, from the letter, but he couldn't tell me, for example, the size of his cell or what he did during the day or anything about the guards. I was like, well, are they friendly to you? Are they unfriendly to you? What are they like? How is your daily life? And of course, he couldn't go into any of those details, but he could tell me a little bit about his meeting with his brother for the first time and, and his work, and it was, it was a, it was a great letter. <laughs> Turning to the two of you. Yeah. Um, you know, I think part of it was kind of just reaching out to literally everyone you could get an email address to mm -hmm. or phone numbers, but then also a lot of people said no, or a lot of people talked. Um, well, people said no. I'm, I'm just str struck by that. Uh, uh, you know, our, yeah. my instinct would be, I'll tell you what I can. Is it, was it fear? Was it fear of endangering the journalist? Or? It, was, um, it was a lot of hey, I want to help you, but I don't want to, you know, I'll talk to you, but I don't want to be a part of this story. Um, and I think that goes into the chilling effect kind of mindset that, yeah. that I saw time and time again. Um, and so that's, that's kind of what I went for. I, I, you know, immediately when I started talking about Iskinder, you get this kind of like inspiration factor for what he was. And so that was a really easy setup for the story. Uh, but then also I got really, um, I had long conversations with a, a Zone 9 blogger uh, who is now on the West Coast, um, and really tailored my story to that focus. But then, you know, there are a lot of journalists who I just talked to, and like I said before, who were just like, they were so eager to pass on other people, but yet, for the reason we talked about, they were just, didn't want to be associated. Talk about Eskinder the person. Yeah. I, I know a little bit now about his Eskinder the professional. What about the person? You know, he's one of the most... Well, he's probably the most well-known Ethiopian journalist in the world, um, and his, his name carries weight to these journalists when you talk to them. Um, he, uh, got, he graduated from American University. He, he is in his late 40s, early 50s. I'm trying to get that right. This is for mine. He's still relatively young man. Yeah, his, um, his family is in America. I try to get in contact with mm -hmm. them, but I think that's part of the you know, not wanting to reach out, and you have to respect that. Um, and he's been, in, he's been in prison multiple times. The most recent imprisonment was on the um, anti-terrorism proclamation, which Ethiopia passed in 2011. Uh, and Dana kind of touched on this before, uh, as kind of like the two opposite ends, you have the, the, the random causes or spontaneous things, but then uh, in, in his case, it was more of, um, you know, revolving around the Arab Spring, and the, any type of opposition or, or fear of that. Mm -hmm. um, and that came into play a lot. And when you, when you had convert, the very, very few conversations I had with government officials, the very few, um, it was all like that the anti-terrorism proclamation worked around um, England's or uh, the United States, Great Britain's, you know, it, 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 it built off of those. So, so the argument was, well, we're using the same laws, um, but it, I think it's also you know, how you use those laws um, that was controversial for so many. So in my case, um, I've, I've always used social media as a, as a reporting tool, uh, Twitter, Facebook, just to kind of you know, look people up, see what, mm -hmm. see what exists or what kind of footprint they have in that world. And in my case, uh, well, Seymour was uh, sentenced just a couple days after I got the assignment. So um, I, you know, I was looking for him on Twitter, didn't find anything particularly about him, but I saw people tweeting about him um, and just w went through a process of reaching out to as many people as I could. And, and you, I kind of was uh, triangulating my reporting, mm -hmm. so I'd, I'd look on Twitter, find a source, look that source up on Facebook, see if I could figure out, well, do they work together? Are there, because so many Azeris are so open, you can kind of click through their pictures and, and find out, you know, okay, well, if they're in a picture together, what does that mean? Um, and so, so in the process, I, I uh, started speaking with uh, somebody who uh, worked for the political party that Seymour is affiliated with. Um, 
went from there to an email conversation to a Skype conversation and um, you know just as any journalist will do who else should I be talking with about this person um, who else can help and he took a uh, somebody in the room took a screenshot uh, or a picture of him talking to me via Skype um, he tagged me on Facebook and before you knew it I was hearing from so many people on Facebook I have a ton of new Azari friends uh, <laughs> some of whom I can talk with some of whom uh, you know there's a language barrier but um, just in doing that um, I there was one person in particular who reached out to me who said, well, do you know this particular um, Azeri journalist? He's working in DC. Um, I didn't know him, but now I've become, you know, he's become a great uh, resource mm -hmm. for me. Um, he, he's, you know, just indelible, the help that he's given. Um, so just, we went really from, from that sort of social media to, you know, which seems like this very impersonal world to a very personal world where, you know, I'm meeting with people who are in DC um, and then getting more sources as a result. What do you know about your journalist as a person? As a person, uh, I'm, st I'm still working. It's still a story that's going mm -hmm. on. So um, I have some other people I'm trying to reach. Uh, there is a woman who I'm in touch with um, who uh, talks with him in, in prison, I believe twice a week. He gets two phone calls a week, uh, about 15 minutes a time. Um, so, you know, I, I know he was a very is a very passionate journalist. Um, Beyond that, I'm, I'm still learning the personality. Well, the and, work in progress. Right, sure. exactly. How many journalists does CPJ say today are in prison? So we do a prison census on December 1st every year, and as of December 1st, there were 221 journalists. So this was the third year in a row that there were more than 200. And I think um, there's a couple points. I mean, Anti-state charges are by far the charge that's used the most yeah. to imprison journalists. So 60% of journalists are in prison on anti-state charges. But we also see the use of anti-terrorism charges, which is under that category. We saw this, you know, 9-11, uh, you know, really led to more of that. But I think now also with ISIS and with, you know, the, the violent extremism and trying to counter that online, we're in, a, we're in a very dangerous place because we're also at a point where, you know, the Internet is no longer this kind of area that was relatively free in many countries. Of course, there were countries like China and Saudi Arabia from the get-go that really didn't let it be free. But in many countries, it was the space where, um, you know, even in very restrictive countries where you couldn't own broadcast media, couldn't buy newsprint, um, you could have online presence. But now, you know, with, uh, with expanding attempts to restrict online expression and then couple that with surveillance, and this goes back again to the really critical role that the United States plays and the reason that U.S. journalists, I mean, I think this is one interesting point that surveillance has now touched journalists in the United States. They realize that government surveillance of journalists and media outlets along with, you know, mass surveillance in general is a serious threat to press freedom. And when you have the United States, which has traditionally been one of our allies in the fight for press freedom, undermining it. It's and very often an example of free press. How, exactly. How you, well, you provide an excuse like, um, you know, like Teddy said in Ethiopia, using the excuse of, well, the U.S. is doing this. We were, um, I was just in Egypt with a colleague meeting uh, with Egyptian officials about the remaining journalists in prison. And, you know, they're like, oh, there's, there are no journalists who are, you know, imprisoned here on, on public, for what they published or what they said. No, no, they're terrorists. Um, or they were involved with, you know, a terrorist group. And meanwhile, they're trying to buy this very sophisticated surveillance technology. So things are getting even worse. I mean, it's hard to believe that things could get worse, but I just love this project because the fact that journalists here care about what colleagues around the world are doing. We don't live, it's not like you can be a U.S. journalist. The stories are global. The implications are global. The companies working in these countries are global. So all of this affects everything. I think the other thing to keep in mind is as well is this, this mushrooming of these anti-terrorism laws that are all framed in the same way on U.S. anti-terrorism laws. So they look at you know, you look at Australian or U.S. anti-terror and they go, oh, okay, and then you know, they're, they're framed in that same way. And I think in some ways we have to take some responsibility for that too. Dan, where does the project go? Uh, it's a work in progress. The project just itself, Project Uncuffed, just uh, launched. 
Uh, where does the project go from this day? Where, where are you going next? Well, uh, this, the, it's the phase one of the project that's launched, which is the Indiegogo campaign, which is for all of you who haven't been on Indiegogo before, a crowd uh, funding uh, campaign. So you go there and you decide whether you want um, to donate. And that money goes in order to make the, the bracelet. So we don't have a pool of money that we're working off of. We have to raise it. Uh, and there are various things that you can be offered. Uh, if you up your contribution, some very cool things, um, including a, um, a script from the Homeland uh, writers who have donated this script and it's assigned by everybody and it's, a, it's a, from their pilot, um, but also some behind the, the National Geographic, behind the scenes type things. And then we, we plan, we hope to raise at least uh, 30,000 and then we have this wonderful group of manufacturers in Memphis, Tennessee, who came to us through uh, a wonderful person who's an alumni of Merrill named uh, Rosemary Osman, and she has a public relations firm in New, York, <clears throat> in New York, but she volunteered and really has made so much of this possible. And this group of guys in uh, Memphis who have the, the Lucite factory, the shipping and the packaging factory, they've all come together on this issue. And now we've found that there's an Ethiopian journalist who is in exile living in Memphis who's going to meet these, these, uh, the people who have brought this together. And they're, both sides are really excited about it. So on World Press Freedom Day, we hope to have at least the first 10,000 bracelets made. And they will then be for sale for $10 a piece. Uh, and the hope is that we can make um, there are nine journalists right now whose names will be on them, and our hope is that we can continue to raise money through the sales, through Indiegogo, so that we can continue to have you know, another round of journalists on the bracelets and another round after that. And it's not really just to raise money for CPJ, even though, as you'll see in the, the closing video, they make the lives of journalists better through their emergency assistance program and many of the other things they do. But it's also to try to create um, a social media uh, campaign mm -hmm. that f feeds on the one that CPJ has already done, but perhaps now involves more students than it did before and more young people than it did before, not just in the United States. So we're trying to promote this at journalism mm -hmm. schools in the United States, but also overseas. As a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter, in, just in terms of the craft, uh, what are the lessons from your class oh, on my, this uh, project? The lesson for me is I have to get to know Twitter and Facebook so much better. <laughs> no, really, it's, it's, it's you know, I thought of it as this yeah. kind of throwaway entertainment thing, but what Courtney in particular did <laughs> yeah. Yeah. was to show me how you can, you can investigate things that you couldn't ever investigate without it. So, you know, I'm, I've got my, Layla gave me my first real lesson on how to do this. Uh. And I intend to um, take many more from her and others. Very good. Uh, we're going to ask those of you in the studio if you have a question. There are some microphones here that if you want to line up at those, we'll try to get to you uh, as best we can in the time we have left. But um, Courtney, for CPJ, um, this rather extraordinary partnership for a group that's, I think, reached out to many partners through the years, but not necessarily to a student group. Uh, because I, I think of CPJ, as somebody, as you mentioned, in terms of the, to protect journalists, I think of the practitioners, I think of the bricks and mortar journalists, uh, but I don't think of necessarily a student group reaching out to people in prison. This is a pretty extraordinary partnership. So it's actually coming at such a perfect time because as the advocacy director, one of my goals for this year and part of my strategic goals in the coming years is to expand CPJ's um, reach into journalism schools, both on the advocacy side, but also on the practitioner side. I mean. Journalists in journalism school are going to become the journalists who are on the front lines, whether those are digital or physical. Um, and they need to have, you know, an idea about how to keep themselves and their sources safe. And they, you know, can also become early advocates for press freedom. So this is, you know, such a great partnership. We actually have um, partnered with universities here, J schools, um, on the launch of our attacks on the press 
book in the past because it's a re really great resource for um, looking at some of these press freedom issues. But I just love this because this project emphasizes the fact that these are these are real people with families, and it's not just it's not just a number. We you know we know the importance of each individual fact, and we have you know profiles on each of these journalists, and now these you know more information to personalize and humanize them, which is so important because. You, know, you go into these meetings with government officials and they want to argue with you about numbers, but we go there and we are dead certain that we have our facts straight. We have the information on each of them. Again, when I was in Egypt a few weeks ago, you know, like, oh, this guy is not registered with the press syndicate, therefore he is not a journalist. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, the press syndicate, by the way, only covers print journalists. So, you know. Was it, and that was a broadcaster? <laughs> it was an internet-based <laughs> journalist, okay. so like completely outside the framework, you know. So it's really, really important to have not only the facts, but also to personalize this, because these are, these are, these are people. They have families, and then they are the ones that are making sure that we, as the public, um, have the access to information and know what you know what's happening in the world. Can I just? And one other thing is, um, for me, I worked mainly in the area of national security, covering the Pentagon and the CIA. And you know, I care so much that this doesn't wither away, and it's difficult reporting to do. And one of the reasons that I wanted to come to Merrill, I'd say a huge reason, was to figure out whether. You could teach um, students and get them to care about this, and obviously <laughs> that was not hard. Yeah. So we're um, we're setting up a center for global security journalism at Merrill, in which you know I'm hoping, well, that this class will be a part of always, but that you know that will grow into uh, you know attracting students who can see security as a global phenomenon and then know how to report about it, like these students obviously have done during this class. Um, we didn't get a chance to talk about this in advance, so uh, if you don't have what I'm about to ask, I understand, but I can recall a half dozen stories in my career where there is something I will always remember about them. And I wonder if there's something you, so far as you've done the work, have that sort of thing you'll never forget. The experience is a thing that you take with you, but there, I can recall on a certain story, a, a certain comment or an expression or one of the people I met. Is there, is there anything yet for you on that? These sound like such personal experiences. I'm just curious if you, if you do. Yeah. Um, I mean, I kind of mentioned this before. Uh, my, my story was really based around um, really one journalist and then a couple others who are either in the U.S. Um, or just out of Ethiopia. And so I would ha I've, I probably had like 12 to 15 hour total conversation uh, with this one journalist um, who's getting his graduate degree, uh, and I think I think what was um, what was the the thing I'll always remember is just you know I was asking him like well how did you get into journalism what you know what why why are you so interested in it and it was the same reasons that I have you know like he was just telling me uh, a story that he read about and that and how effective it was and it was just like a very nitpick local story but mm -hmm. how it changed this one thing and like you know that's the same exact answer I would give with a person who maybe couldn't be more different than you yeah, with my, you know yeah. however many miles away um, and I think that's been the most the, uh, the thing that stuck in my head yeah. Um, and and yeah so I think for me it's it's the the passion. I mean, you don't get into journalism for money. Um, <laughs> if you if you do, then good luck. Yeah. Um, but I, I I've spoken to so many journalists that um, you know from Azerbaijan that are either there or are now living in exile who are so excited for the attention that we're giving to their stories, um, just for the hope that it could help um, you know get these uh, get these journalists, these human rights defenders out of jail. And what what and, and one thing that I've I've you know been saying constantly is you know it's it's about access to information. It's about how we get our news about the world around us. And if you don't have that, where are you? Hmm. So I, I've just I've just been blown away by, by how um, willing people have been to share their stories and 
talk about their experiences. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and so many of them, uh, you know, Khadija Ismailova is one of the Azerbaijani journalists who's also been um, really writing about corruption uh, within the government. And they just, they have such passion. Uh, there's a story about Khadija who um, at one point was sentenced to um, uh, sweep a, a street uh, as part of uh, one of one of something that uh, happened with the government, and she said she was sweeping away corruption. I mean, it's just that <laughs> that passion to keep going that it just is so impressive. For me, I think it was that um, first real contact, for lack of a better way of putting it, and sounding very cliched, is like the the tenacity of the human spirit and the mm -hmm. the fact that you know the stories that I got from Peter's family who you know, tell me what he was doing in jail to keep himself going and to just keep himself sane and also the family when the brother kind of just went expletive happens and we just got to get on with it <laughs> like yeah. we just have to get on with it and figure out a way to get him out and it was just that he was he was a farmer he's a farmer from New South Wales it just went all right what, what's next what do we do now. And I just thought that was so extraordinary to me that that was, it really got, got to me. Well, that's really something. Uh, the program is called Press Uncuffed. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a program of the students at the Philip Merrill College of Journalism at the University of Maryland. And we've been talking with three students who are deeply involved in that project who are tracking individual journalists. Uh, Leah uh, Sarsavik, uh, Courtney Mabius, and um, Teddy Aminavar, also with Dana Priest, uh, who is the night chair now, uh, a night chair at the Philip Merrill College, and with Courtney Ratch from the Committee to Protect Journalists.